would stand with me. If you have not already, join hands with your neighbors, stretch out across the aisles as we, as we pray together. The scriptures declare that where two or three are gathered together, such as touching and agreeing, there will I be in the midst of them. Gracious God, we need you. We cannot make it without you. The days would seem too dark. The nights would seem too cold. We need you, God. Every moment, every hour, every second of every day, we need you. We need you, God, in every aspect of human life. We need you in our schools. We need you in our halls of justice. We need you in our neighborhoods. We need you on our streets. God, we need you in our churches. But more critically, God, we need you in our hearts. Have your way, God. Have your way in a way that removes our will and replaces it with yours. Father, we need you. God, we could not wake up this morning without you. We wouldn't be standing here today, God, without, without you. So, Father, we humbly submit ourselves to you and ask that you would have your way. And Father, you would open doors of opportunity for us, for your people, that no one can close and no one can take credit for but you. Father, we pray that you would strengthen the ties that bind us together. Help us, Father, to, to be the example of love that we want to see in the world. Father, we pray for the families and the victims of tragedy. God, difficult circumstances that we cannot explain. God, we don't know why anybody would sit in a church, feel the love of the body of Christ, sit next to the pastor, have a conversation with him and be able father in demonic utterance be able to pull out a gun fire at will at innocent innocent people God we don't understand that kind of behavior what we know God is that we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against spiritual wickedness in high places, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. And so, Father, we cannot fight with carnal weaponry. God, we cannot defeat unseen enemies with, with tools of, that have been made by man. But Father, help us to carry with ourselves and with our people the breastplate of righteousness. Help us to put on the shield of faith and to carry with us the sword of the Spirit, which is your word, God. Help us to carry that, not only in here on Sunday, but give us the strength and the fortitude to carry it with us everywhere that we go. In every village, in every hamlet, in every neighborhood, in every street, on, in every school, in every mall, help us to carry it with us everywhere that we go. We need you, God. We need you, God. We cannot survive without you. Father, we're grateful that nothing can separate us from your love. Not death 
or life. Or anything present or anything to come. Nothing can separate us from your love. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for leading us. Thank you for lifting us. And help us to lift Jesus in such a way that he's able to draw all men, women and children unto himself. Father, we thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you for comforting those who are grieving. We thank you for lifting the burden of those who are confused. We thank you for providing opportunities for for employment, for those who are unemployed. We thank you, God, for helping us with a path forward out of poverty. Give us the strength, Father, to stand with you and not to try to stand on our own. We've tried it our way, and our way doesn't work. Help us to do it your way, your will, your way. In the marvelous, matchless, majestic name of Jesus. In that name that can save and soothe at the same time. In that name that can strengthen and heal. In that name that can lift you and lead you. That can raise you and redeem you. In the name of Jesus. We pray this prayer and we ask these blessings. And the people of God pray together, amen? Amen. 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 And amen. Let the people of God say amen. amen. If you would stand with me in reverence to the reading of God's word. And the scripture is, has been adjusted. The one in the bulletin says John, and we'll be, uh, that's not the one that we'll be lifting. We'll be lifting a passage in Joshua, the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. The book of Joshua, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Joshua chapter 1 verses 1 through 5 in the New International Version says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God for his word. You may be seated in God's house. And I'd like to tag this particular text and this message for these brief moments of sharing that we have together today with the title, It's Time to Elevate. It's Time to Elevate. 
As we celebrate Father's Day, and we just honored and celebrated Juneteenth, and as we assess our history as families and as a people of faith, we are quickly and easily able to identify some places where we have changed and grown because of God's infinite and unmatched grace. For those of you who don't know, Juneteenth is celebrated as an annual observance of the date when Union soldiers con con enforced the Emancipation Proclamation to free all of the remaining slaves in Galveston, Texas on June 19, 1865. Texas, Texas was the last state to let people still be property and they did not tell those enslaved for two and a half years that President Lincoln had already signed the Emancipation Proclamation. The word didn't reach them for over two years so we celebrate their liberation on June 19th. So today, today while we are saddened by the suddenness of some of our sickening circumstances we can be encouraged because when this church was established there was no hope of a person of color occupying the White House there was no hope for integrated restaurants and schools there was no hope that you could park your car way out in the suburbs in front of your suburban home there was no hope that the internet would give you access to people of every nation and tongue there was no hope that there would be cell phones that could take pictures and videos no hope that there would be women in boardrooms and at, in CEO's chairs. There was no hope for paved streets, power windows, or padded pews on which you sit. And so we sit here 122 years later. We can testify that God has brought us from a long way. We got miles to go and mountains yet to climb. Mountains in our criminal justice system. Mountains in our racial relations. Mountains in our education system. Mountains in our family structure. Mountains in our polarized politics. Mountains in our harmful language mountains and our understanding that we wrestle not against flesh and blood because only an agent of demonic forces could walk into Mother Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church sit for a while hear the prayers of the righteous listen to the soothing and soulful singing and calculatingly and coldly gunned down men and women of faith who opened their doors and welcomed him even though he looked nothing like them we still got some mountains to climb but I can still say God brought us from a mighty long way. Let me park parenthetically using my pastoral privilege here for just a moment. Mother Mother Emmanuel, a citadel of freedom and liberation, a gathering place for people of faith for over 200 years, an example of the greatest ideals and values of humanity, a place where Denmark VC and others were hanged trying to fulfill the mandate of Jesus to set the captives free. We bow with your Mother Emmanuel and pledge to keep elevating the moral consciousness of our citizens, to keep elevating the dialogue about salvation and reconciliation our nine brothers and sisters we pledge we will continue to carry the banner of courage for Jesus in your honor it's time for us to elevate it's time it's time for us to go up to go up a little higher it's time it's time church folks for us to stop reporting these crimes by race because that speaks to a man-made construct created to build division but to speak in terms of humanity in, in nine people were killed by a lunatic a hate-filled gunman, a terrorist who was emboldened by a system that values violence and guns. He was emboldened by a system that allows entertainers to use hate-filled words in their music that allows the production and sale of video games that promote prostitution and murder. A system that permits under the guise of the Constitution people to get guns more easily than they let. You can get a loan for a house, a car, or a college education. You can get a gun without having to take a weed test, a cocaine test, a crack test, you can still get a gun without ever having to produce any legitimate thing that says I ain't a drug abuser. Uh, he was emboldened by a system that let a sitting congressman from South Carolina, no doubt, Joe Wilson called the president of the United States a liar you know, on national television. A uh, sitting governor wagged her fingers in the president's face. Uh, Kansas Speaker of the House, Mike O'Neill, I'm calling you out, he cited a Bible verse that wanted the president's wife widowed and his children often. Another congressman called my president a tar baby. Sarah Palin said he was shucking and jiving and all their friends and colleagues and cohorts do is just laugh at him. But words matter. They matter. They make a difference. They're, they're pastors in their churches. Uh, my white evangelical brothers and sisters are silent about the vileness of their remarks. 
Those with platforms on, on Fox News, I mean faux news, and, and some of them on CNN, CBS, ABC, NBC, and all of them, none of them are exempt. We still got mountains left to climb. Because they're all guilty of verbally lighting the old clan crosses of bigotry and, and hatred for look, people looking for somebody to champion their cause. See, all a nut needs is one person to be able to co-sign what they do. We need our brothers and sisters of different creeds and colors, our white brothers and sisters, to stand up with us against systems. We need people who are privileged by the system and advanced because of the system to stand up against the system. We've got mountains left, but I still believe that God has brought us from a mighty long way. Oh yeah, yeah, we've been, we've been bought, but as I look out upon the landscape, I'm still troubled in my spirit because I believe that as we as a people have become more blessed, we've also become more broken and fragmented. Uh, when we had nothing but each other, we lived in the freedom of community. But, but now that we got more than each other, we seem to like to live isolated from community. Do you, do know, you do know now in our community, there is stuff that we do instead of coming to church. Stuff we do instead of coming, coming to church. We, we, we go to soccer practice instead of coming coming to church. We, we'll put our fraternity, our sorority e event instead of coming to church because now we got more than each other. We live isolated from communities. So there are those who would have us to believe that there is no more racism to fight. There, there are people who would argue with you that there's no more sexism to overthrow. There's no more elitism. There's no more oppression. There's no more poverty. We got beyond all that and in some strange way we've made it in America to the promised land. Some would have you to think that just because there are packed pews that we see from our pulpits that people are truly living in the freedom of Jesus Christ. Because President Obama, First Lady Michelle Obama, Sasha Obama, and Malia Obama are the residents in the White House that we must be in the promised land. Black bodies are no longer swinging from picnic packed poplar trees, but we're now dying at the tips of bullets from friends and foes. We have not yet come to the promised land, but we're in the midst of what's called a promised moment. Moment. Uh, promised moments can be experienced by you as an individual, but it's not until we all have promised moments together that we can get to God's promised land. Uh, and when we try to build monuments to the moment, we lose sight of the work that still needs to be done. Uh, we're building bigger cathedrals with expert sound systems and lavish technology. You know, there's some churches that can do it. If you got a sound system, a certain sound system in some churches, even when you can't sing, the sound system will make you sound like you can... Oh, you can, you can sing. You do know this. That, that's just a moment. There, there are children who don't know their daddies. That's just a, it's just been a moment. There are people who still live in utter poverty, so it was just a moment. There are churches being foreclosed on right now. It's just a moment. There, there's a school to prison pipeline in our communities. It's just a moment. Our children believe that they're growing up in a post-racial America where they can act like everybody else and still get treated the same, but that pool party in McKinney, Texas, that prayer meeting, that Mother Emmanuel was a quick reminder that you're still not equal in everybody's eyes. It's just it's just a moment. My mama and daddy told me you got to work 300 times harder to get the same results, but we ain't telling our children that no more. Uh, zip codes and area codes determine, help me Jesus, how long you live and your quality of life is just a moment. You do know rich folks in California where they've been experiencing record droughts. The rich folks believe that they should be able to use all the water they need while our brothers and sisters in Compton are suffering and can't drink any water that, that they get that's what they believe it's just a moment we'll worship together on Sunday in here and then act like we don't know you you're beneath me on Monday it's just been help me Holy Ghost a moment a moment a moment a moment a moment, a moment when President Obama was elected, we very quickly dashed from yes we can to oh no he won't. It's just a moment in a land of absolute influence and affluence. There are folks who can't find a job. It's just a moment. There's sick folks who can't get to see a doctor. There are children raising themselves. There's sex without commitment. We made that mainstream. It's just a moment. 
A moment where we could sense victory. A moment where we could smell the promised land. The, the goods baking in the promised land. A moment where we could look out and we could see the tall trees in the promised land. But don't get it twisted. It's just a moment. And our ancestors did not risk their lives so we could have a moment. They didn't bleed and sweat for a moment. They didn't pray and cry for a moment. They didn't scrimp and work their fingers to the bone for a moment. But they did it so we could go up a little higher with God. Help me. Holy Ghost, they did it so we could reach a little farther. They did it so we could elevate each other. This turbulent text is an earth-shattering moment in history, a moment of transition, a moment of change that alters the way the Hebrew people would look at the world going forward. For these people, in the book of Joshua, their old landmarks are gone. No more manna from heaven, no more water from dry rocks, no more shotgun houses, no more picking cotton in the fields, no more being sharecroppers. This is a new moment. No longer do do they have to live with accommodations that say Hebrews here and Egyptians over there? A new generation has surfaced standing a few feet from the promised land and this new generation has no recollection of the slavery days in Egypt. They don't remember the segregated days of living in Egypt land. They have access and they weren't there during those times. I'm going somewhere. The oppression, the segregation, the marginalization for them are just stories that are being promoted by an aging population that will soon be gone from the scene too. Uh, this generation of Israelites is on the verge of living a life that their ancestors could only have dreamed about. It sounds to me like the isness of what we got going on right now. I, I believe that we've been stuck in little moments because we stopped telling the stories of the tenacity and fire that ring in our collective history. We stopped talking about determination and grit. We stopped talking about hard work and discipline. Stop talking about rules and expectations and so we've been stuck in moments when God wanted to elevate us to a movement. Uh, we started just letting anything go. Uh, we started approving of quitting and dropping out. We started to let our children tell us what they want to do and where they want to go. We start to rationalize, philosophize, and compartmentalize so we could justify what we're doing and so we're stuck as a community of faith in a moment. We stopped being willing to challenge and confront chaos and confusion. We stopped teaching our boys to be gentlemen and our girls to be ladies. We allowed doctors to tell us that our children can't behave in school because they got some disorder, but disorder does not give you a license for disrespect. Uh, we stop demanding yes sir and yes ma'am. We're stuck in individual moments. Never mistake a moment for God's movement. It's just been a moment. <laughs> Moses in the text is dead. That's what the text says. The Moses generation is gone. They would celebrate Moses. They would honor his sacrifice. But Moses is gone. The fact is that according to Dr. Otis Moss Jr., there is danger in living after you get out of the wilderness, but before you get to the promised land. The danger is that people sometimes get confused and think that just because you made it through the wilderness, then that must mean I'm in the promised land. I, I got out the wilderness. That must mean I'm in the promised land. In, in America, we're stuck in the in-between place between the old wilderness and the new promised land. It looks like we're there. It sounds like we're there. But then something happens to remind us that we still got walking to do, still have some radical reconciling to do. And so because, because some of your grapes are bigger at your house, uh, some of your air is nicer because of your zip code, your, your sun is hotter, your ice is cooler because your refrigerator is so new and your grass is greener, you think that we have made it. We made it, we made it, but, but we're just stuck in between, stuck in between societal assimilation and God's true elevation, stuck between the wilderness and God's promise. And the Jewish literature is always clear about this one point, that success is not defined by what you do individually, but it's defined by collective and community progress. We're not elevated individually until we're elevated together. We can't get caught in the moment because even though we may have breathed the air of possibility and promise, there are sisters, there are sisters and brothers who are still stuck on the other side of the river who are only smelling the air of failure and hopes unborn and stillborn but God is looking for some people the community of faith that he can elevate so we can elevate others Joshua Joshua is an example of what God wants to do with his church and his people the Moses generation had to walk through the wilderness they had to battle slavery they had to find water in rocks they had to get food from heaven they felt the lash of oppression whipping their backs and the fact is 
is that the elevation that Joshua is about to get is only because the Moses generation made it all possible. Stay with me. And Joshua could be elevated because he understands that he stands on the shoulders of Moses. He understands that without Moses, there could be no Joshua. He understands that if his parents and grandparents had not endured master's whips and chains, if they had given up on God, if they hadn't had a little church, if they hadn't prayed and cried, then he would not exist. And so clearly somebody had told Joshua the story about Moses and his people. Somebody had made an investment in Joshua to tell him the story when he was little before years had allowed him to form his own opinion. And so those of us who know the story, you must not be ashamed to tell the story. Tell your children how hard your mama and daddy worked. Tell them about the struggles that had to be endured. Tell them that life ain't always been easy. Tell them that the Xbox One and color iPhone 6s are not required for you to grow up. Tell them that God gives and takes away. Tell them that there are knuckles that bled for the cotton on your shirt. There are arthritic hands that help to secure the leather on your shoes. Tell them because if you don't tell them, they won't ever know. Why? Because we have been erased from the history books. They won't know what they're made out of. They won't know that they can handle adversity. They won't know that they were meant for this moment by God. They won't know that they can do anything through Christ who gives them strength. If we want to be elevated, then we got to keep on talking to each other. Somebody shout, tell them, tell them, tell them. We got to tell them. The, the late D.E. King used to tell a story about when the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. D.E. went to Atlanta to console Dr. King's mother and father. Well, two years later, he has to go back to Atlanta because Dr. King's brother, A.D. Williams, drowned. So now Dr. King has died. His brother has drowned. D.E. goes back to Atlanta to be with Daddy King Sr. Then after that, Dr. King's mama was shot to death during a church service while sitting at the piano playing the piano. D.E. has to go back to Atlanta. Da Daddy King has lost his wife and two of his sons. Well, Reverend D.E. didn't know what to say, so he went to Daddy King's home. He goes into Daddy King's bedroom. Daddy King meets him halfway up the stairs and says to D.E., I'm glad to be here. Huh? Yeah, I thank God for what I have left. Huh? And D.E. looked at him like he was crazy. He said, I, I, Daddy King, I don't know what you're talking about. He asked him, what do you have left? You done lost Martin. You, you lost A.D. Your wife has gone on to glory. Daddy King looked up, tilted his head slowly towards glory, and he said, I still got God. Huh? And if we're going to be elevated in this generation, if we're going to elevate our consciousness, if we're going to elevate our community and elevate our families that somebody has to be willing to testify that I still got God. It's time to elevate because we still got God. Come hell or high water, I still got God. Through crooked and rough places, I still got God. Is there anybody here that's glad that you still got God? When the mountains go up, God. When the valleys show up, God. When the storms rise, God. When my daddy leaves me, God. When my parents separate, God. Somebody got to tell the story that I still got God, God! Help me, Holy Ghost. God, God wants to elevate us as a faith community so we can have an impact in our homes, in our hoods, and in places where there is no hope. So the question the text pushes us to raise is how do you handle being elevated? How do you handle being elevated? There are two answers, and I'm going to sit down first. First, first, if we're going to be elevated as a community, you got to keep your right mind. Don't go crazy. You got to keep, keep your right mind. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. I feel, I feel like crazy sometimes. I do. I feel, I feel like going ballistic and off and just laying folks out sometimes. I, I, have, I thank God for the Holy Spirit because I sure do. I feel like it. I feel it. I feel it sometimes. Every now and then, it, it feels like it would just feel good to just help me Jesus. It does. Y'all ain't going to be honest, but I'm going to be honest with you. It feels every once in a while. I just, I just, just, if I could, I could just want to, I just want to say some of those words that they just come to mind that just, I just want to say, but 
or keep your right mind. The fact is that Joshua understood that if there had been no Moses, if there had been no Abraham, then he would not have access to the promise. Because guess what? The promise was made to Abraham. Joshua knew that before he could ever cross the Jordan River into the promised land, that the promise was not made to Joshua, but was made before he was born. Those of us who live today, both young and seasoned, must understand that we are here because of God's promises to those who are no longer with us. If you're living in this Joshua moment right now, you got to keep your right mind and know that you can never forget that it was the Moses generation that got you to this point. It didn't happen out of cosmic coincidence. It didn't happen because of your philosophical diatribes and discussions, but it happened because the Moses generation made this moment possible. And so if we're to be elevated, we must keep our right mind and understand that we ain't get here by ourselves. You didn't pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Stop talking that foolish talk. The reason you can graduate from school, the reason you can access scholarships, the reason the mortgage lender can only legally deny you if your credit is jacked up, the reason you can be an officer in the military, the reason you can be a business owner and a patent maker has nothing to do with you. It's got nothing to do with your ability, with your education, with your intelligence. Guess what? Because a hundred years ago, we had people with ability who were educated, who were intelligent, who had influence but couldn't get any of that stuff. But your right mind better testify that the reason that all of this can happen is because there is a generation that went on before us and made the way clear. <laughs> And so in your right mind, you got to remember that this moment that will lead to our elevation, this moment that will help us rise as a community of faith is not about you and it's not about me. But when I was a new 26-year-old pastor, pastoring in a church that was over 130 years old, and we had 100 and 125, 150 members, and 75% of them were old enough to be my grandparents. And, and one of the senior deacons invited us over his house for dinner, uh, and we thought he was going to give us some sage advice, senior deacon, his sage advice. We thought he was going to give us some, some encouragement. We thought that he was going to help us with our transition, but all he did was talk about all of the people we needed to look out for at church. All of the people, you, you need to watch out for Brother No Good and, and, and Sister Run Tell that. You need to watch out uh, for Reverend So-and-So. He really wants your job in the first place. He applied for it, so, uh, but he's still here, so you better watch out for him. And he was just trying to poison us with his toxin. Uh, but, but, but I had a wise pastor of Moses, Dr. Donald Taylor, who said to me, I shared the conversation with him. He said to me, young man, let me give you some advice. If you got to look out for everybody, then you don't leave much room for God to take Take care of you. And I learned, I learned that day to thank God for my pastoral Moses who helped me keep my right mind. And the fact is that this moment that we're in now is about the named and unnamed people that we can never thank. It's about great grandparents and founders who we can never touch. It's about people who could see the lightning flash and who could hear the thunder roll that we can't tell how much we appreciate them. People who had to scrub floors and floorboards. People who had to go through civil wars. People who had to be brave enough to to stand up amidst death uh, to oppressive systems, people who had to hide in attics and basements, uh, people who had to build their own houses of worship uh, with their own bare hands, uh, people who had to be called boy and girl, uh, not Mr. or Mrs., uh, people who were stereotyped and vilified. Uh, and so if you've got your right mind, uh, you'll realize that this life thing ain't only about you. Uh, if you've got your right mind, uh, you can be elevated because you'll never forget what the Lord has done. Uh, our history is filled with Moses uh, in every culture, in every family, there are Moses who started schools. There are Moses who taught themselves how to read. There are Moses who started businesses. There are Moses who told you that you could do it. There are Moses who never gave up on you. And so you better keep your right mind and thank God for Moses. Do I have any help in here who will thank God for your Moses? Every family has some folks who set your standard, who paved the way. And so in your right mind, you got to thank God for Moses. I believe that we started to let Moses fade into the recesses of history. Uh, Moses is no longer relevant to us. Uh, Moses is no longer necessary. Uh, the enemy, the devil, would have you believe uh, that you can be disconnected from Moses and still fulfill your destiny. Uh, but God dropped by to tell you uh, that your future, your elevation, uh, is connected to Moses. Uh, Joshua understood that he couldn't take leadership of Israel in his own power, but he could only do it because of Moses. Uh, God even uses Moses as a reference point. I like what God says. Uh, he says, as I was with Moses. See, 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 God, we, we miss that. We run, like to run over that. God is telling you, don't get it twisted, young cat. 
Now don't, don't get this, don't get this misplaced in your mind. God is telling you, don't get it twisted as I was with Moses. Don't forget the Moses in your life. Don't forget the Moses in your church. Don't sleep on the Moses in your family who are still with us because God's presence is connected to Moses. And the moment we started disrespecting Moses, we started not revering and listening to Moses. We talk back to Moses, God's presence. Then, uh, because God says, as I was with Moses, you don't have a frame of reference for your relationship because life has been a bit easier for you, Joshua. But as I was with Moses, remember Moses. We'll be elevated, faith family, if we keep our right mind and remember Moses. But, but secondly and finally, and I'm done, not only do you need to keep your right mind, and it's hard sometimes to understand, but secondly, this will help you keep your right mind if you know your resources. Keep your right mind, and then I'm done. Know your resources. Knowledge of your history is critical. Knowledge of Moses is necessary, but there is a second thing that Joshua in the text understands. He understands that history is important, but you also got to know about your help. Not only do you need to know your history, but you got to know about your help because your history and your right mind is only influenced by the help you have. If you want to be elevated, if we want to be elevated, we got to know our resources because the text references both history and help both right mind and resources it says as I was with Moses that's history so shall I be with you that's your help so your resources the God of your salvation your resources God himself for he says I'll be with you I'll never leave you nor forsake you and so we got to make sure we know our resources okay you didn't catch it like that well after LeBron announced that he was coming back to Cleveland he announced it almost a year ago a, a year ago we we are LeBron fans in my family I told y'all last week I've been rising and fall I'm so glad the series is over. I, I'm not stressed out no more. I could go to sleep on Wednesday night and Tuesday night after it was done. Oh, it felt so good to not be up till four o'clock in the morning watching all the replays and the reruns and, and, and so forth. And my mama is a LeBron fan. My, my, my wife is a LeBron fan. And, and so we quickly, when he announced he got, he was coming back to Cleveland, we quickly uh, got tickets to the first game of the season when they played the New York Knicks. They lost, but that's all right. I went downtown early the day of that first game and noticed that the parking prices were elevated for that day. Stay with me. I saw spaces that were normally $10 on that day were $30. They, and they were like a mile from the stadium. They, I, I saw spaces that were $20. They, they were going to go for $50. 50 not $50. 50 $50. 50 and, and I saw a few that were going they, they were $30 spaces. They were going for $75. I, uh, capitalism in all its glory. I, I, I I called a few people around the church to find out where there would be a good place to park. And, and most of them suggested that we take the train downtown. But, but you know, my daddy was coming with us, so we were trying to limit the walking that he would have to do. So I made a call to a good friend of our families who has an office downtown to find out if there was a space in their building where I could park because it was close to the queue right across the street. They, they got a building in the... I said, I know they got to have a parking space. They ain't coming to the game. They could just hook a brother up. And as I'm inquiring about spaces and where I should park. The next thing I know, I hear my friend on, the, on another line ordering a car. I thought they were ordering a car for themselves. Maybe they were going out of town and then they came back on the line with me and said, Dr. Davidson, I know your daddy has problems walking, so I'm sending a car to your house to pick you all up and escort you. Stay with me and escort you to the gate. Guess what? I ain't got to be big time. All I got to know is at least one friend. Uh, he'll drop you off and guess what, the, guess what the driver gonna do? The, guess what the driver going to do. Doc, doc, the driver going to drop you off right at the front door of Quicken Loans Arena and he'll be waiting there for you in the same spot when you're ready to leave. Uh, if you're ready to go at halftime, he'll be there. Uh, if you're ready to go in the second quarter, he'll be there. So not only did we get to go to the game, but we had an escort to help us get to where we were supposed to be. Uh, all I'm telling you is you got to know your resources. Uh, I hear my Bible pushing me and telling me that the Lord is your keeper and the Lord is your shade. Uh, the Bible says says uh, that nothing can separate you from the love of God. Uh, the Bible says uh, that greater is he that's in you uh, than he that's in the world. You've got to know your resources. 
God just sent me here for a few minutes to tell somebody that the God that you serve can get you anywhere, anywhere, anywhere. Somebody say anywhere, anywhere. The God that you serve can get you anywhere that you need to be. You ain't got to connive and backstab and manipulate your way. God can get you anywhere, and I mean anywhere that you need to be. Because your resource helped Abraham become the father of nations. Your resource helped Joseph become a ruler in Egypt from the pit. He helped Moses bring water from a dry, crusty rock. He helped Joshua fight the battle of Jericho. He helped Gideon defeat the Midianite masses. He helped Naomi get her joy back. He helped Daniel interpret the king's dream. He helped Job never give up on his faith. He helped David knock down Goliath. He helped Ezekiel see the first orthopedic surgery. He helped Elijah call down fire from heaven. Let me park on your street. He woke you up this morning. He guided you up in here. He grows your life. He lifted you up. He leads your hand. He heals your body. He keeps your soul. And he loves your life. Know your resources. He'll help you when you're surrounded on every side. He'll help us elevate our community. He'll be strength when you're weak. He'll be shelter in a storm. He'll be healing when you're sick. He'll be grace when you're guilty. He'll be mercy when you're messed up. You got to know your resources. And my God, who is our source and resource, wants to encourage you to know that he has a diversified portfolio. What do you mean, crazy preacher? Moses asked God, God, what is your name? Because the people going to want to know what to call you once I leave the burning bush. But God told Moses, I can't give you my name. Just tell him I am that I am. God was saying that if I give you my name, that you'll try to limit me based on my name. But I'm so much God that my name is dictated by what you need in the moment. My name is determined by the situation that you find yourself in. You see, God tells you that sometimes I'm Elohim. Sometimes I'm El Elyon. Sometimes I'm El Gabor. Sometimes I'm El Hanora. Okay, y'all didn't take Hebrew. Sometimes I'll be brief over troubled waters sometimes I'll be a friend when you're lonely sometimes I'll be when you're sad I'll be joy ain't God all right won't he do it for you ain't God all right do I have a witness here that knows that God will yes he will meet you wherever you need him to meet you and I can do it because God said I am that I am <coughs> I'm done I'm done and so so I've learned that, that if we're going to be elevated together, if we're going to rise together, if we're going to revive our community together, then we must keep our right mind. And we got to know our resources. And there, and, and you know, there's one more resource that will help you keep your right mind. That there's another resource, the Bible says, uh, that will keep you in perfect peace. A, a resource that will guide your footsteps and that will hold your hand all of the days of your life. Uh, is there anybody here that knows that name? Uh, I, I tried to get you to call the name earlier, uh, and, and only three of you felt like you knew that name. Uh, but maybe there are 300 of you right now uh, that know that name. Uh, is there anybody here uh, that will call that name? What's that name that'll be your resource for you? Huh? That ain't enough. Huh? That'd be all right if that's for me. Huh? But I wanted to know, do you know a name huh, that you can call on when you can't say nothing else? Huh? When you don't know what to pray for? Huh? When you're weary in your well-doing? Huh? Is there a name you can call? Huh? You can't call on anybody else. Huh? But if you call this name, huh, then everything will work out all right. Huh? What's that name? Huh? Jesus. Huh? And Jesus told you huh, that if you lift me up, huh, if you elevate me. He said, I'll draw men unto me. He told you that if you take me down, I'll be elevated in three days because Jesus knows about elevation. They tried him, but he kept his right mind. They pierced him, but he kept his mind. They mocked him, but he kept his mind. And he kept his mind because he knew his father was his resource. And on Friday, he kept his mind. On Saturday, he kept his mind. And early, and I mean early, on 
on Sunday morning. He got up with his bad self, with his elevated self, and said, I've got all power, and this power I have, I leave with you. So it's time to go up, church. No more low-down living. No more down-low living. It's time to go up, and you can go up if you know Jesus. If you know Jesus for yourself, then you ought to get up and go up. If you don't know him, let me tell you something about him. He'll be your comfort. So go on up. He'll be your savior. So go on up. Is there anybody that knows my Jesus? He'll be for you what you can't be for yourself. Any friends in the house? He'll be your redeemer. He'll be your deliverer. He won't ever forget you. He won't ever mislead you. What's his name? Jesus ain't God all right. Ain't he all right? Say yeah. Stand with me, stand with me all over. All over God's house. It's time, it's time for us, for us to elevate, to go up, to go up together. If we're going to elevate, we need to keep our right minds. Keep our right minds. Keep it, keep your right, your right mind. Keep your right mind. Then, then know your resources. Know your resources, that God is your source, and he is your resource. Whatever you stand in need of, God has it. Whatever we need as a society, as a community, God has it. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. The alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. That's your resource. If you call him, he will answer. Father God, we thank you today for being our source, being our resource. Now, God, maybe there's something.